So today we're going to talk a little bit about population ecology. Um, this is a huge topic that we don't have a ton of time to go in great depth on. Um, but if you take marine systems or um, environmental science or IB biology, you'll go into a lot more depth and um, be able to actually uh, collect um, individuals from a population, estimate population size, and do all sorts of cool things. So first thing you need to understand about populations is that um, all populations, whether they're plants or animals or bacteria, are limited by some abiotic or biotic factor. So limiting factors are those that limit the size or growth of a population. Um, often these are essential resources. Uh, so think of like shelter, food, space. Um, in this picture that I have here, you have two areas that are um, the same and in if you think about what the limiting factor of growth or size of the population is for some of the plants that are shown in these pictures is its temperature its weather right when it's freezing cold um, and very very uh, you know the conditions are very harsh uh, that's not ideal for plant growth so plants only grow and store energy um, in the spring and summer and early fall. Um, I want you to take a second to really think through what limiting factors means. And I'd like you to um, pair up with a partner. I want you guys to list as many specific species as you can um, and predictions to what those limiting factors are. So maybe I might say, um, okay, a rabbit species and one of the limiting factors for that, the, the rabbit population could be um, the availability of grasses to eat. So try and get specific on what the limiting factor is. I'll, we'll pause the video here for a second, give you two minutes to pair up with a partner and list uh, species and uh, their limiting factors. Okay, so um, all the populations or populations of the individuals you just listed are gonna grow exponentially when resources are abundant um, or when there aren't a lot of limiting factors, or when the population is relatively new. Um, if you think about, in your book they use the example of like a uh, rotten banana in your backpack, that's going to bring in insects, and so that's an immigration or a new population of insects that then reproduces. When populations are growing exponentially, we show that with an unlimited growth curve called a J-curve. Okay, so uh, rabbits are kind of typical. When food is really, really abundant, um, they're going to make lots of babies and they can do so super quickly compared to some other species. So their species grows really, really, really quick. Um, this exponential curve or J curve is something we see in species that can reproduce quickly and have unlimited resources, even if temporarily. Eventually that's not gonna continue though. Most populations are eventually going to be limited by some resource. You can see the kind of initial J curve here, or you know, quick growth. And then we call this logistic growth, where it eventually evens out, and this is when resources become limited, or the size of the population has gotten to be what the environment can support. Limited growth we call an S curve or a logistic curve. Here, what do you think that the limiting factor is here? Here it's probably space. Space to rest or, you know, could also be uh, food found very close to shore during mating season. So we can graph populations and we see that most populations respond to a carrying capacity or the maximum size of a population given its limiting factors. This is also known as the maximum size the of, of a population that the environment can support. So whether you're a rabbit or a seal or a tree, the environment can only give you so much of what you need. Um, there's so many individuals what they need until um, it just uh, can't support anymore. So you see here we have yeast cell cells in a culture dish um, and they're going to grow really, really rapidly until they reach some kind of limiting factor or reach the limit their environment can support and then they're going to 
what we say reach uh, carrying capacity. And a lot of times when a uh, population reaches carrying capacity, it's not as if they see it coming and they're like, okay, we're going to divvy up resources. No, most populations uh, reach carrying capacity and there's some kind of crash and rebound, crash and rebound as their numbers adjust to what the environment can support. If you think back to the rabbit example, they're going to produce a lot of babies and eventually they're going to have um, a population that's too big for the environment, so they will crash as they deplete their grass resources or vegetation resources and they'll rebound as those resources. It, it doesn't, it's not exactly perfect here, okay? It's also good to know how populations distribute themselves in the environment. So here, we saw that um, population size gets up to a certain point. Here we're going to see how populations kind of distribute themselves in the environment. Um, and populations create different patterns um, depending on their resources or their interactions with others. So to get the most out of limited resources, um, some of the different distribution patterns that populations exhibit include even spacing, where you're going to have um, a kind of a classic example are trees, you know, based on the nutrients in the soil or the amount of water that they're getting from the soil. Trees um, often in savannas will kind of space themselves out evenly. Um, another form is clumped, where many individuals uh, kind of clump together around a central resource. And this can also be found in species that cooperate. So let's take these deer first. Deer, if they have a lack of predators like wolves or cougars, they will clump together and kind of move in this herd. Um, when predators are around, they tend to scatter and move a little bit more independently or in smaller groups, and that depletes less resources. Um, a couple years ago, there was that meerkat um, show where like all the meerkats would pop up and they'd talk to each other and it showed how they're very social. Well, that's another uh, population that lives in clumped areas because they cooperate with one another and they communicate and they um, hunt together. They are going to be, their advantage um, is to live close to each other. Some could argue that humans are exactly the same way. We help one another and we divvy up our roles so that we can live in these clumped populations rather than evenly spaced populations. Last one is random. So this is where no pattern is present and the organism just lives wherever its um, seed was dropped if it's a plant or wherever it ends up if it's an animal. Um, oftentimes these are found in species that are really great at out competing or have really low needs. So if you think about a dandelion, they're both. They're really good at taking advantage of um, poor soil conditions or poor water or whatever. They can out compete other species for those limited resources. Um, so they produce a ton of seed and they just scatter and wherever they end up, they're gonna do pretty well. Um, so we're going to talk next class a little bit more about non-native species or species that have not evolved here and why they're so successful. And some of this has to do with the fact that um, they're really good at out-competing for those limited resources. So taking a look at distribution again, I want to quiz you guys here. I've got three different images. I'd like to pause the video and I want you in your pairs or your pods to discuss um, which one's represented here and why you think this is the case. Okay, why are they like this? Oh, I didn't see that I used the same example. Well, you get a little easy one there. So pause the video um, and, and uh, discuss this and then we'll play it again uh, when you're ready. Okay guys, um, hopefully you had a chance to, uh, you remembered that this is going to be random, right? And this is um, kind of interesting because I just told you uh, humans are oftentimes considered to be clumped. But in this picture, 
it's kind of more of an even distribution, right? Because everyone wants a little bit of sun. They don't want one person's umbrella shading them out to get their tan or one person's radio playing so loudly that they can overhear it right here. So people on the beach represents kind of an even distribution pattern. Another really famous example that we might see on our walk is that a lot of trees that or plants that produce like a toxin in the ground will have a popular or a distribution very similar to this because they they literally change the soil so that not, nothing else can grow nearby um, and so things will be kind of evenly spaced out in that respect. Um, this one here is clumped so um, oftentimes organisms in a tide pool will clump based on the um, you know, the height that the water is going to reach or where the food is that they're trying to um, access. And then again, weedy species are very random because they're so successful um, at surviving. So I want you to keep these things in mind as you go for it into your limiting factors web quest. Um, you've got different forms of distribution here and you also have a carrying capacity with this uh, curve that reaches and kind of crashes and rebounds, crashes and rebounds. You have two different types of uh, growth. You have logistic growth where resources are limited and it makes this S curve. And you have um, exponential growth, which many populations show at least initially with this uh, J curve here. Go ahead and get started on the main factors and you can um, access this PowerPoint uh, on the website if you need help completing that.